Well, the title of this lecture is A Woman Rides the Beast, because that's exactly what it says in the book of Revelation. In the last lecture that we had on Revelation chapter 13, we looked at the various issues pertaining to the papal power and the power that arises out of the earth, and we identified that as the United States, which would force the world to accept legislation honoring the first beast. Now, that is a process which will have to continue over all the kingdoms of the world. Now, Revelation chapter 17 gives us more details on this issue. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show ye the judgment of the great whore, these are strong words, that sitteth upon many waters. So here is a woman that is a prostitute. In other words, she is unfaithful to God. A woman, in a biblical sense, is a church. And there are numerous texts in the Old and the New Testament to substantiate this. Christ is also the husband. He's coming to fetch his bride, the church, the woman aspect over there. So this great apostate woman sits on many waters, and we saw that the waters are multitudes, nations, peoples, tongues, according to the definition in Revelation itself. And with this woman, the kings of the earth have committed fornication. That means they have had relationships with her, which were, of course, contrary to the relations that God would like them to have. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. That would mean, if wine is a symbol of teachings, doctrines, then uh, wine of fornication that makes drunk is doctrine that confuses the mind. So basically what it, the text says is that a church, an apostate church, is in control of issues. The kings of the world have relations with this apostate church and they are drunk, they cannot understand, because they have absorbed these doctrines which are contrary to the Bible because they are doctrines of prostitution. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. So here is a red color. This is a color of sacrifice. And it was full of names of blasphemy. So it is a blasphemous power. And we saw what that meant when we looked at Revelation chapter 13. And the Bible gives us clues by showing that to say that you are in the place of God, that you are God on earth, that you can forgive sins, that you can take that which applies to Christ and apply it to yourself, that's a blasphemy. And we saw that the Roman church had actually done that. So this woman, sitting on the scarlet beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And that, of course, again is the symbol that we had in Revelation chapter 13. If you count the heads that we have in all the beasts of Daniel chapter 7, you will find that there are seven heads there as well. Because the first beast obviously has one head over there, uh, which represents Babylon, the lion. Medo-Persia has one head. Greece is represented having four heads. And then one head of the final beast in Daniel chapter 7 adds up to seven heads. That means over time, all the time periods are covered and have been incorporated into this one structure. This Catholicism structure has aspects of all the philosophies of all the kingdoms of the ages embodied in it. It has perfected paganism, if you would like to call it that. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, two colors which apply definitely to the Roman church. They use the colors purple and they use the colors red for cardinals and for bishops. And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, there's no doubt that this is the richest system that has ever existed. 
having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So this golden cup is full of false doctrines. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery. That means it is a concealed science, if you like. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, which implies that there are others, other women, if you like, that are also apostate, but she is the mother of them all and abominations of the earth. This is very strong language, and we will have to see if this is so. Well, let's have a look at the seven-headed beast. In Psalm 74, verse 14, we read, Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces, and gavest him to be meat food to the people inhabiting the wilderness. So here is a beast that is described as Leviathan, a dragon-like beast, and it is implied that it has more than one head. In mythology, Leviathan has seven heads. Isaiah chapter 27, verse 1. In that day the Lord, with his sore and great and strong sword, shall punish Leviathan, the piercing servant, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Isn't that interesting? Slay the dragon that is in the sea. Do you remember that we had some interesting symbolism when we looked at Mariology, where Mary is called the star of the sea? Interesting, interesting uh, analogies. Revelation 12, 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. So here we have a dragon in Isaiah, and we don't know how many heads it has. We have a Leviathan in Psalm 74 verse 14, which is applied to the dragon in Isaiah 27 verse 1, and in Revelation we see that it has seven horns. Can you see how it all fits together? If you use parallelism, you can find all the heads uh, that you need and seven crowns upon his heads. So this dragon in Revelation chapter 12 is a ruling power. He is in control. He is the prince of this world. Jesus calls Satan the prince of this world. Revelation 13 verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So here we have now a division into ten horns, that's ten kingdoms. Upon the horns ten crowns, that means the beast ruled with these ten kingdoms. That's the time of the Middle Ages, when Rome ruled by means of the powers of Europe. Revelation 17.3 and so I car carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Obviously, this is the representation of the kingdom of Satan throughout all the ages. And in Revelation 17, we're going to have the culmination of his power in the final events just before the coming of Christ. So the dragon has seven heads. In the book of Revelation, the heads denote political powers through whom the dragon works. But just for interest's sake, it is interesting that Satan tried seven times to set up his own unchallenged kingdom. Firstly, there was a war in heaven. And God's response was expulsion of Satan from heaven. Then, Adam and Eve and the pre-flood world. He tried to set up his kingdom. God's response to Adam and Eve, promise of redemption, sacrificial system. Then, Tower of Babel was his next attempt to set up unity of all the nations on earth. God's response, confusion of tongues, separating the nations. Interesting. Then, during the Incarnation, he thought if he can destroy Christ, he can set up his kingdom. 
Victory over sin and death was God's response. Turning the greatest apparent defeat into the greatest victory the universe had ever seen. He tried to set up his kingdom through pagan Rome, and the answer, Smyrna resolve. People were prepared to die rather than to be eliminated. He tried to set up his uh, system through papal Rome. The answer, reformation. Nowhere could he succeed. Will there be a final time when he will try and set up his kingdom? Something where all the nations come together in one great new world order? Is that possible? That would be interesting. Seven times he would have tried. And there is an answer which I've called the midnight and loud cry. But we'll deal with that in another lecture. It's kind of complicated. Revelation chapter 12 verse 3 says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. This power was going to make war against another system of earth, on earth, obviously representing God's people. And so there is a dragon, and it attacks the woman in white. And this war will continue until the coming of Christ, so the Bible says. So this creature that we found in Revelation 13 that came out of the sea tell, uh, tells us what the attributes of the papal power are, because this is a system that has all the attributes of the little horn power in Daniel chapter 7. So it is the same system, and it tells us that it has Medo-Persian components, because it has the feet of the bear. It has Greek philosophy in it, which tells us... The whole evolution theory, by the way, is based on Greek philosophy and comes from there. It has Greek components in it, and then it has the ten horns, which represent this final power which would control eventually the whole world. So heads of lions with ten horns. And a woman is of course the church itself, the ecclesiastical arm controlling all the political powers, decked in purple and red and holding this cup in her hand. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, blasphemy. Revelation 17, verse 3. And the purple and the scarlet colors and the gold and the precious stones. Rome is the richest church institution in the entire world. The treasures that are in the Vatican Museum boggle the mind. It is unbelievable. And in this golden cup, there are all these abominations of her false teachings. Now, we have already seen that she is called mystery. Now, something that is a mysterious or mystery is something that works behind the scenes that is secret. And she is the mother, mysteriously so, of all the other harlots as well. Does she control all the churches? in the world that are apostate towards God? Is that a possibility here? Well, we haven't looked into that issue in great detail yet, but we'll come to that in another lecture. Revelation 17 verse 5, the old Babylonian religion and the old bull cult, all of these, these ancient religions, we will find all these aspects in Rome. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4 says, They will turn away from listening to the truth and give their attention to legends. So the church would eventually succumb, and instead of believing in salvation through the Lamb of God that was sacrificed for the sins of the world, they will have all kinds of notions which will satisfy their own egos. Psalms 116 verse 13 says, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. So, which is our choice? Are we going to use the systems of the world and be comfortable? Or are we going to call upon the name of the Lord and be ostracized? That's the choice that we have. The Tower of Babel, a woman 
calling herself Babylon, or the Bible calls her Babylon, and all these features fit together. Second Thessalonians talks about this mystery in chapter 2, verse 7 to 10, for this mystery of iniquity does already work. So this stealthful working was already working in the time when this was written, when Paul penned these words, this power was already working. Only he who now letteth will let until he is taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. What does that mean? And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, but that they might be saved. Powerful text. Tells us the circumstances of the rise of this Antichrist system. And it tells us that there was something holding it back. So basically we could read this as he who holds it back will be taken out of the way and then shall this wicked one be revealed. So something is holding it back, the system, which was already working in, in the time of Paul, but it would be taken away and then the system would rise and it would work with lying wonders, deceivableness, unrighteousness, and it will deceive the whole world, taking away the truth from people. Let's have a look at this tremendous reference in Paul's writings regarding the man of sin. Now we beseech you, brethren, by, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Jesus is not coming yet, that he said. Jesus is not here, as some of you think. He's not coming yet. It's not soon that he's coming. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. So Jesus' coming will not happen until there is a falling away and the man of sin is revealed. The son of perdition. Interesting word, the son of perdition. Used only twice in the Bible. Did you know that? Used only twice in the Bible. Only two have been called sons of perdition. The one is this man of sin, this system, and the other one was Judas. Now, if I'd like to ask you, how did Judas betray Jesus? With a kiss. So did he present himself as one of them, yes or no? Isn't it possible that this system, the son of perdition, will also present himself as a representative of Jesus Christ? and betray everyone with a kiss? Isn't it possible? Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. And we saw that the papacy actually did that. And this is that spirit of antichrist whereof we have heard that it should come even now already is in the world, 1 John 4 verse 3. So this power was working in the time of John and in the time of the apostles. This is not some future power, There's, as many believe that will come uh, sometime in the future as futurism teaches in the world out there. Remember ye not, Paul continues, that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withholdeth 
that he might be revealed in his time. So Paul said to them, I told you that something was withholding the Antichrist, preventing it from developing, and you know what it is. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he that now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The uh, BBE translation says, there is one who is keeping back that evil till he is taken out of the way. So something was withholding this power from rising. And when that something has been taken away, then the Antichrist will come. And then shall the wicked be revealed, and the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So God will fight against the system with the word of God, and finally will destroy it at his coming. That's a promise. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, and we have this text again of how he works. So when will this Antichrist arise? Paul told them that something was withholding, we don't have the facts here as to what it was. So here, Gratian Guinness, Romanism and the Reformation, writes, here we have a point on which Paul affirms the existence of knowledge in the Christian church. The early church knew, he says, what the hindrance was. The early church tells us what it did know upon the subject, and no one in these days can be in a position to contradict its testimony as to what Paul had by word of mouth only told the Thessalonians. Today we are saying, what hindered it? It was the Holy Spirit. It was that. It was that. It was the other. No, we don't know, because Paul is the only one who told them what was hindering it. It is a point on which ancient tradition alone can have authority. Modern speculation is positively impertinent on such a subject. That makes sense. Can the early church fathers tell us what Paul had told them, what was holding it back? Tertullian, on the resurrection, chapter 24, this was written 200 AD, says the following. He who now hinders must hinder un it until he be taken out of the way. What obstacle is there but the Roman state, the falling away of which, by being scattered into ten kingdoms, shall introduce Antichrist? Interesting. So that's what the early church fathers understood. That when Rome finally collapses, then Antichrist will come. That's what they believed. Let's continue. John Chrysostom, homily on 2 Thessalonians, that was Bishop of Constantinople, 390, says, Only there is one that restraineth now until he be taken out of the way. That is, when the Roman Empire is taken out of the way, then he, Antichrist, shall come. There's another one that says it. Interesting. Well, Paul says the power was already working then, and sooner or later he will arise. There's something hindering it, but when it goes, I told you what it was, then it will arise. Here is Edward Elliot, commentary on the Apocalypse, and it says, we have the consenting testimony of the early fathers from Irenaeus, the disciple of St. John, down to Chrysostom and Jerome, to the effect that it was understood to be the imperial power ruling and residing at Rome that had to be taken out of the way. Gratian Guinness says, while the Caesars held imperial power, it was impossible for the predicted Antichrist to arise. On the fall of the Caesars, he would arise. That makes sense. The biblical prophecies make sense. The 1,260-day prophecy makes sense if you look at all of these issues. And uh, while the Caesars held imperial power, he would arise. On the fall of the Caesars, he would arise. Grattan Guinness, Romanism and the Reformation. There are numerous that, uh, sources that say this. Paul did not identify the restraining power, which they knew to be Rome, for fear of reprisals. Remember, the Christian church was under persecution by Rome. So Paul wrote them an epistle and he said, what I told you personally, you know what it is, that must first happen, so don't go teaching all kinds of doctrines. We're waiting for the falling away, the man of sin, the obstacle to be taken away, the man of sin will arise, and then he will rule on this earth. And then only, eventually, will Christ come and he will consume this power when he returns. That's the biblical version. 
1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Will you notice that? God was manifest in the flesh. Let's not change that justified in the Spirit, seen of the angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. That's the only mystery in Christianity. No other mystery. We will never comprehend how the God of the universe could have become man for us, died for us, and then save us and make us Sons and daughters of the Most High. It's a mystery. We'll never understand that. Everything else has been revealed in its fullness, but this will remain our study for all eternity. That is the mystery of godliness. The mystery of iniquity wants to undo this salient, eternal, central fact of salvation. And we have already seen in the lectures how the efforts have been made to reduce the workings of Jesus Christ. And how through the secret societies, the ancient Babylonian religion, through Kabbalism and Gnosticism, removed Jesus Christ as the deity that saves and replaces it with another power. We've seen the Islamic secret societies, and we've see what, seen what the Quran teaches, that Jesus was not the Son of God that he never died, and that his blood was not shed for us, that he was whisked away, that he's spiritualized, he never came in the flesh. All of these issues. We see this is the very central doctrine of Rome today and is the theology of the Vulgate. The Templars, the Rosicrucians, the Jesuits, Freemasonry, all of them hold to the central doctrine. Two doctrines in the world. Not a hundred not 200, not 300, and not 500. Two doctrines in the world. All wearing different cloaks. All controlled by one power. And where we saw the woman with this nice little mini skirt. You soon think, thought the mini skirt was something new? No, no, no. It is very old. There it is. And, uh, well, this lady of... I don't know whether she was a lady of the night or a lady of the day, but this lady with a golden cup in her hand represents the worship of Baal. And uh, Fides, how fascinating. Sita del Vaticano, Fides, we saw, very interesting, he has the meaning of the worship of the goddess. The initiates, the e insider initiates, were the Fides. And we wouldn't know what that was if we didn't have this nice quote from Albert G. Mackey, 33 degree Freemason, which says, The right hand has in all ages been deemed an emblem of fidelity, and our ancient brethren worship deity under the name of Fides, or fidelity, which was sometimes represented by two right hands joined, which is also what uh, Freemasonry does, and sometimes by two human figures holding each other by the right hand. Numa was the first who erected the altar to Fides, under which name the goddess of oaths and honesty was worshipped. Obligations taken in her name were considered as more inviolable than any others. Here's a mystery. We are showing you one side, but we actually teach another. Morals and Dogma, page 292, you will recall we had the secret symbols, where we had the PX over here, which is on so many preaching rosters and pulpits and altars today, and it's given Christian connotations for the goyim, for the catechumens. But here, the insider himself tells us it is the staff of Osiris. So it is the representation of the male member that sits in the boat. Fine. And he also told us that uh, the various other symbols that we see over here are pagan symbols. The Tao and uh, this cross over here and the swastikas, this way or the other way, and the stars of David. And then this interesting statement, the vestments of the priests of Horus were covered with these crosses and then you have the Maltese cross. 
and I showed you that the papacy has this on its vestments and the bishops wear it as well. These are priests of Horace. That's a mystery. You have to look behind the scenes to find it. The mitre that they wear on their head that today looks that represents actually the fish head of the god Dagon, which means Dag on is the fish god. So the fish head, later the cape was removed, the fish cape, it was replaced with a red cloak or a purple cloak or whatever color, but the mitre with the open fish head on top remained. There you see in Babylonian relief in the uh, Pergamum Museum, you see the fish with the open mouth, the mitre on the head of the priests of Babylon, and here they had pails with water, and they had little branches of hyssop that they put in, and they sprinkled it upon the waters, and this is exactly what the papacy does. The bishops walk with their holy water, the Pope has a branch of hyssop, and he sprays the people. This is Babylonian ritual. This is cleansing through Bab El. Bab the gate, El God, Bab El Babel, portal to God. Jesus says, I am the door. I am the gate. Jesus is the gate. There is only one way to heaven, and that is through acknowledging our sinfulness and accepting the vicarious sacrifice of the Son of God who died for us. That's the only way there is to salvation. But Babel says, no, we have another portal to God. That's a fascinating story. We're going to have a look at that in another lecture. Do you know how many Babs there are in the world today? Oh, they all call themselves Bab, Sai Bab, Ban. Oh, you name it. Lots of Babs out there. We better watch out for all the Babs. Only one Bab that leads to God, and that's Jesus. Only one gate, only one portal. But here's another form of cleansing. Jesus says, I will sprinkle you with hyssop. Papacy says, no, 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 I'll do it. You'll be saved through the system. No other way. Two ideologies clash. The priests, they were bowed down to, their slippers were kissed, their rings were kissed. This is paganism. There's the sign of Shamash, which you will find whew, everywhere in the world today. Unbelievable where you will find the signs of Shamash. The Gnostics, founded by Simon Magus, who according to Eliphas Levi, became sorcerer to Nero. History Le Maga, Magi, page 199. These are the very prominent sources. Levi. Now people like to have that name on the back of their, whatever, you know. Very prominent. And if you go to Rome, this is a symbol that you will find over there. This is... Uh, outside of that ancient pagan temple where all uh, religions were honored. And on the bottom you have the square, which is Masonic. Then you have the elephant on top of that. And then you have this symbol on top with a cross on top. And it, everybody says, that looks very nice. Unless you know, of course, that the square is the symbol or the cube of the ancient deities and that the Elef is the Alpha, the Elef, the first letter, the Elephant, which is the bull of the East. So in Hinduism they still have the Elef as the symbol of the sun god. The first one in the Hebrew it is the bull. And on top of it the missing piece of Osiris and on top of that, the Tao. So you have the full catastrophe of pagan worship in this symbol over here in Catholicism. And crimson and purple are the colors. Isn't it fascinating that they believe that we have the knowledge of good and evil? So we will find that the Pope will always be dressed in white. He represents the white side, the Luciferian side. And his side man, his sidekick, if you like, the one who is the military dictator of all of this, will wear which color? Black. 
So the head of the Jesuit order always wears black, so that you have both sides of the knowledge of good and evil. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of the abominations of the filthiness of her fornication. Strong language. If you take the papal crown, the papal triple crown, that comes from Medo-Persia, if you had that crown alone, you could probably get all the debt out of the United States of America if you sold it. And the priests that uh, officiate, they have the same colors and they, of course, here celebrate the Mass, which is the literal sacrificing of Jesus Christ again and again and again and again. Seated on the papal throne before the main altar in St. Peter's, Pope Paul listens to Cardinal Sunan's famous sermon on Pope John, delivered during the second session of the Council. The sermon began... There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Very interesting. What happened at the Second Council? Well, at the Second Council, all were invited again into the sisterhood of the churches, except that Rome would be the mother and everybody else could remain a sister. Isn't that interesting? Interesting. Idolatry was the, the worship in the old System, idolatry, is the same worship in the present system. Exactly the same. But idolatry takes many forms. Idolatry doesn't mean just bowing down to a statue. Idolatry could mean something else as well. And wouldn't it be interesting if we knew that Rome actually controlled that aspect as well in its totality, completely and utterly? Well, we cannot today go into all the systems of idolatry, that would be impossible. But uh, idolatry does not mean just bowing down to an idol. You could have different idols. What about world sports? And who controls world sports? Well, if you look at the symbols that they have, every single one of these super clubs has a Masonic symbol. It's very interesting. The greatest football team in the world, Manchester United, even uses the devil directly. Why not? Sounds good to me. <laughs> Masonic ladders, Masonic chevrons, uh, signs of shamash. Why not? These are the greatest teams in the world. And what about all of these? We have animals of darkness. We have uh, flying horses, which is Pegasus. We have all these interesting symbols with pentagrams and uh, shields of Malta and sun symbols and pentagrams and double-headed lions and goats, all the symbols and fleur-de-lis, you name it, we have it. Masonic M's, Masonic anchors, the whole shooting match. The Masonic fingers, the... Um, Skull and bones, Titan is actually Satan's Greek name. So we have all these interesting features. The G, we, anybody who's a Freemason will know that that comes from the Masonic Lodge. If we go to Exodus, chapter 32, verse 2 to 6, And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters. Well, today... Earrings are very popular. And bring them to me. He made a golden calf, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast of Jehovah. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now, what did they play? What did you think they played? Well, part of the system of sun worship was to play sports. What kind of sport did they play? That's very interesting. Well, let's go to UNESCO. They should know because the UNESCO um, manifest, as you know, was written by a Skull and Bones member. So he must be an interesting insider. And he writes, for example, Polo was known to the Persians and restored to its original sun game significance by Akbar. 
Scoring a goal with a sun ball was equated with the triumph of light over darkness, good over evil. But remember that masonry calls light darkness and darkness light and calls Jesus and Jehovah evil. So the triumph of light over darkness represented in paganism the triumph of Lucifer over Jesus Christ. So the triumph of darkness over darkness, good over evil. The ball is the sun symbol in all such sports as football, hockey, basketball, cricket. Baseball is related to the sun and the sundial shape and the pattern of the field as well as its rules of play and scoring. Like all sports, baseball also embodies the sun's seasonal cycle in much the same way as ancient ceremonial contests were held as part of fertility rites. So if you can't get them to the church, get them to the sports field. Isn't that interesting? And in the church you see the arms going like this. And on the sports field, you see the arms going like this. Hymns are sung in the church. Hymns of a different nature are sung over there. It's quite fascinating. Who cares as long as he has worship? Sumerian Gilgamesh story inscribed in cuneiform tablets narrates how the sporting equipment, a stick and a ring or a ball, which Gilgamesh had carved out of the uprooted tree, had fallen into the netherworld as he began oppressing his people by repeated athletic competitions. Now, eventually, it was the sun god who opened a hole in the ground in order to recover them. So if you had a stick and you had a ball, if you took the stick and you got the ball into the hole, that was a symbol. It has a deeper meaning than what we really believe. Actually, it's quite a um, meaning, but forget about that. That's what golfers do, for example. You know, it's amazing. And how often we are told that this is marvelous and it's good for Christianity and all these things. I have nothing against sports. Sport is a good recreation. Sport is good for exercise. There are things that you can do with sport that are good, but if sport becomes a religion, isn't that problematic? Isn't that idolatry? The Olympic torch, which the runner carries to mark the sun's cyclic movement through the Olympiad, the four-year period until the next games, is also related to the sun's cyclic rhythm. First celebrated in Greece, the name was ceremonial contest none of Zeus. Did you see the opening ceremony? Now, the Greek one, didn't they honor the gods? Yes or no? Yes. And we go. Off we go. Well, sun, moon, and other planets float overhead. Barcelona Olympic Games, the sun's association with sports, predates the deities Heracles and Apollo in Greece, as is evident from the epic tale of the Sumerian hill hero Gilgamesh. Fascinating stuff. As in sport, the sun is omnipresent on practically all aspects of life, whether it be art, architecture, philosophy, religion, festivals, folklore, dance, music. Wow! He's got every base covered. Every morning a pagan god of the day wakes us up. For the Romans in the early century of Christian era named each day after the seven planets, Sun, Moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn. If we look at the symbols of the Olympics, you'll see they've got Baladad symbol, Baladad symbol, Baladad symbol, Baladad symbol, Baladad symbol. You can find them all over there. This is paganism. Here is a young man bringing a fine hockey shirt to the Pope. Let's see what he will do with it. A fine hockey shirt. <laughs> wow, that's a blessed shirt. So, Freemasonry controls all these issues for Rome today. The sporting world, the religious world, this is fascinating. I wonder how much idolatry is hidden in the mystery and how much more the Bible wants to reveal about this amazing story of Revelation 17. This is a picture of St. John's Lateran. Now St. John's Lateran is the main church in Rome. 
Not St. Peter's, that's where the papacy is active and does all its major things. But this is where the Pope is crowned, and this is where he speaks ex cathedra. Uh, again, please note that it's called St. John's. Remember, I've told you before about the St. John's secret of the Templars and how they were Johnsonites, Johansonites, if you like. The wine of her fornication, the mother of the churches, Imater Ecclesia. Revelation 17.5 says she is the mother of prostitutes. Revelation 18.7 says, I sit as queen, I am not a widow, I will never mourn. And Isaiah 47 verse 8 says, I am, that's God, and there is none beside me, I will never be a widow or suffer loss of children. So if church is separated from her, maybe she'll get them back, she says. I will not suffer loss. Dominus Iesus, other churches are no sisters of ours, the Vatican insists. September 5, 2000, the Independent. Well, the Church of Rome fulfills every single prophecy. It must always be clear that the one holy Catholic and apostolic universal church is not the sister but the mother of all the churches. Cardinal Ratzinger, 9-4-2000. He makes it pretty plain. Cardinal Ratzinger is the head for the foundation of doctrine and faith, which is the old Inquisition. Definition of incredulity, heresy, apostasy, there is no graver offense than heresy and therefore it must be rooted out with fire and the sword. That's what the Catholic Encyclopedia said in 1911. Uh, the Catholic Catechism says incredulity is the neglect of revealed truth or the willful refusal to assent to it. Heresy is the obstinate post-baptismal denial of some truth which must be believed with divine and Catholic faith. So if the Pope has said something and you say, I don't believe it, you're a heretic. Must be rooted out with fire and the sword. Well, Protestantism said that. I don't want to accept that anymore, it said. I will not believe it. And so the Western Watchman in 1914 said, Protestantism is not a religion, never was a religion. The most that could be said about it was that it was a form of rape and robbery masquerading as a religion. There was a problem there. The Council of Trent, called by Pope Paul III between 1545 and 1563, met in three sessions. Protestants were present during the second meeting. I'll be dealing with this in a greater detail in another uh, lecture. But it's fascinating to see that the Council reaffirmed the doctrines disputed 